welcome back everyone. This is um, episode four of the Fresh Air series and we're going to go through some um, great cases with Irene again and have our great panel that you all know and uh, take it away Irene. Hi, I have four more cryo cryopsies for today. Mm. It's again ILD, so staff for run ups and here I have, I'm going to read the, again, I'm going to read the short story and you decide who, who is going to, to talk about the case. So he, here is case number five. It's a 60 years old woman who is a smoker and has positive Reino and positive Anna. Is that the way you say it? Yeah, positive Reynos and positive ANA. Yeah. ANA. <laughs> okay. So his, his father died of IPF. And the city says DIP. Who wants this case? I can take this first one. Okay. Sorry. Are you seeing yourself this? <laughs> okay. no, Do you no. see your pictures? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, so these are cryobiopsies. And then you have some liver that's orienting it in the top right. Is that uh... no, yeah, perfect? So let's begin with the first fragment, that is this one. Oh. So really quite prominent lymphoid aggregates that we're seeing. Um, that... And then there's some also inflammation within the interstitium. Um, I'm not really seeing, there are some pigmented macrophages there, but that to me is just in the spectrum of a smoker. They're not diffusely filling the, the space. So um, that's not really what you would expect to see if in, in the term of DIP. It's just a big airway. And a fragment of alveolar lung here. Um, so a bit of inflammation in the interstitium. It's on the minor side, a bit of collapse here. The, there's a little bit of fibrosis, but um... I think this 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 uh, fragment is is artifacted. You see, yeah. I, I I see a lot of um, recent MRIs, and I yeah. and I think these um, the, these macrophages here are not emosiderin laden, but are these Smoking. pigmented alveolar macrophages. So I think these sometimes uh, fragments in cryobiopsies are artifacted. So hmm. I think it what happened here that has artifactual MRI. But uh, okay. I this case because it has many macrophages. This one is fairly normal, I would say. Maybe a, a little emphysema? Yeah, a little emphysema there. And again, macrophages. Yeah, so I think in this case, I would be largely descriptive. I don't think I could definitively call this anything. I think I would describe the findings that there's some pigmented alveolar macrophages, a little bit of inflammation. Um, I'm not seeing a definitive fibrotic lung disease here. Um, there's very minimal fibrosis, but it doesn't really look like that ropey collagenous fibrosis that I've seen so far in these pieces. Um, and then there's some lymphoid aggregates there, which I think are also a nonspecific finding. Um, so I think I, I would be descriptive in this case and maybe comment on a bit of emphysema as well, but I don't know if we have a definite explanation for what's going on, unless others can can put it all together. What do you, what, uh, anybody else wants to say something or would do, do it uh, some, somewhere? No, somehow? I agree with Matt. I agree with Matt. I would also be descriptive. I think there's smoking related changes in the background and there's some lymphoid aggregates, some inflammation. It's all very non-specific, all of it. Yeah, and also wanted to add germinal center formation. Is that real germinal center in those two lymphoid aggregates, little pale areas in the center? Um, again, um, the I think the, the thought process here is patient can be smoking and also have connective tissue disease. Um, so there could be two things going on. Or they could be weird. So when 
two things are going on. We don't have to struggle trying to combine everything into one. Um, and I agree with others that descriptively describing this would be helpful for the patient. Great point, Raghav. About two things can be going on. Great point. Yeah. So before I, say, I would like to see if the bronchovascular bundles are carrying a bronchiole also along with the pulmonary mm. artery. Yeah. I have to have more, more levels of this. So here we I have a, a big bronchial. But I don't think if I'm going to be able to answer your because minimal yes. change, so a constrictive bronchiolitis, a small airway disease is going on in my mind, especially in this fragment. Well, I, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I, here I see the, the muscle attached to the epithelia. To, that I, I, that's what I would call constructive bronchiolitis, that the bronchiola disappears or it, or it has a thick fibrosis under it. But can, I make a comment? To... Irene, can I make one comment? Sorry to interrupt you. So one thing about Sharda's point, you know, because they say that a lot in textbooks that you must, um, you know, look for a partner and uh, airway narrowing, constrictive bronchiolitis. I, I have noticed just anecdotally, you know, no, no evidence, but I've noticed in my practice because we see a lot of transplant, we see a lot of true obliterative bronchiolitis in transplant rejection. I feel that outside of the transplant setting, true constrictive bronchiolitis is almost extraordinarily rare. It's very, very easy to overdiagnose constrictive bronchiolitis because of a little narrowing, a little, you know, you can't see the bronchiolar partner. It's very, very easy to overdiagnose constrictive bronchiolitis in a non transplant setting. So I'm very cautious of that, not, not to overdiagnose it. Okay, got it. So, uh, well, in this case, I, uh, I was descri descriptive, as you mentioned. I, I said emphysema with pigmented alveolar macrophages and uh, one fragment with inflammation and lymphoid follicles. You can imagine that when this comes to the MDT, it, uh, people wonder about this, these follicles because the patient had, this is what happens, but we cannot answer. This is not an SIP. And I, I found this, this, this biopsy was interesting because I see fo lymphoid follicles in many, in many biopsies, and especially in smokers. Uh, when we, you see the explants, they have many lymphoid follicles, and I, I found some papers well, that, that talk about lymphoid follicles in, in, in the smokers. That, well, it's inflammation, and it, it works in many entities, not only in those that are connective, but connective. But, uh, the, when you see it, you have to report it, and and it it makes it, it makes the discussion go on. Nobody yes. is going to think this is not <laughs> connectivopathy again. But what I see is smoking related everywhere. Here, despite it's it's, it's light and smoking related, it's not SRIF. I mean, it's only pigmented macrophages. But this uh, the scammative pneumonia they are seeing probably is smoking related and not because of, uh, of an NSIP or something. So yeah. not NSIP, no UIP, uh, but descriptive smoker related. Agreed, Irene. Actually, your lymphoid follicle observation in smokers, I have also seen exactly the same thing. And I tried a little bit to document that in our uh, AJCP paper, to document that those cases also have a lymphoid follicles here and there. Actually, this would be another great study we could do if we have, you know, just collect a couple of cases of smoking related whatever from all our institutions and just um, see how many lymphoid follicles are in each. Very easy to do and very, it would be a good message to put out there in the literature that you can get lymphoid follicles in things that are other than connective tissue disease. I think the pushback will be, they'll say, well, did you test for CTD in those cases? How do you know that they don't have CTD? You know, that, that argument just goes on forever. The CTD uh, maniacs, you know, will never admit that something is not a CTD, even if the CTD workup is negative. Because the final argument they always have is, well, CTD is negative now. How do you know there will not be a CTD 15 years down the line? So there's no way to, to prove that kind of thing wrong. you know. <laughs> so they will never accept that the lymphoid follicle is not specific for CTD. 
just like hypersensitivity in neuronitis. It's not a matter of what you have in the biopsy because they can still suspecting. Uh, it's, uh, it's not in our hand. You have to describe what you have in the biopsy and if it fits okay and if not. Okay. Yep, yeah, <laughs> Anna, Anna can come back anytime, ANA. ANA. <laughs> So let, let's move to the next case. Great. So case number six is a 70-year-old ma male who is an ex-smoker and has morning cough. And, and he had pulmonary fibrosis diagnosed 10 years ago in a work revision. I imagine that just by CT. The CT says UIP. When the CT says, says UIP, I don't know why we get a biopsy, <laughs> but, but we, I got it, <laughs> I got it. Again, this is a, a cryobiopsy here with the, this piece of kidney to, to localize. Uh, I have this. Who wants to talk about this biopsy? I can talk about it since I saw the kidney. <laughs> <laughs> the kidney is okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the kidney, yeah, the kidney uh, makes me think that it's all real. So yeah, we do have pieces of lung here uh, with a big blood vessel right in the center uh, going across. And then we have uh, uh, different irregular spaces, all over spaces. But I don't see any free-floating septa or anything to think of. Maybe there's some free-floating septa to think of some emphysema. Um, and then some of the interstitium is, I think, a little bit thick, not in all the areas. It's only patchy. It's only very uh, focal kind of areas. It's, yeah, right there. Yeah, it's a little thick. Um, and then there is also in that area, I saw some prominent reactive pneumocytes, like plumpy looking cells lining that. Um, but otherwise, yes. uh, yeah, um, let me uh, annotation. Trying to find the annotation, I, it's right here somewhere. The fourth by the right in mind. Yes. I think this cells right here and these guys right here, plumpy looking cells. But I'm also looking for some macrophages. I found some macrophages because the theme of today looks like macrophages. Uh, they do have some pigment within them. So I will just call few sparsely distributed pigmented airspace macrophages with some interstitial um, Thickening. There's also smooth muscle hyperplasia in some of those expanded interstitial areas. Um, what about this? That, uh, this area, yeah, this. I was wondering if it doesn't have a perfect picture of a fibroblast foci, um, but it does Not have some feel. Or here. Oh, that. Yes, this one looks like a fibroblast foci here. Yes. I'm going to look for more about you because it's where, where I wanted to drive you. <laughs> yeah, they also look like some interstitial expansion with pale uh, fibroblastic tissue. So those could be fibroblast foci, but I don't see any mature fibrosis in that piece, but coming to this piece, um, there's a lot of fibrosis for sure. And there's some interstitial inflammation, lymphoid aggregates. So uh, there's fibrosis, there's fibroblast foci at the junction. Uh, back, you have mature fibrosis and in the foreground, um, you have some uninvolved, but it the piece ends right there. So it's difficult to say if it is really at the interface, but I want to give it a chance, consideration of an interface kind of fibroblast foci. Uh, this one looks like a airway wall of the airway, uh, smooth muscle of the airway. Um, and then there's some surrounding all related parenchyma where there's little expansion uh, of the interstitium. Uh, so yeah, so this patchy fibrosis, 
and the fibroblast foci, there's some macrophages, um, no honeycomb changes, uh, with the history and the radiology UIP. Um, I don't have the spatial orientation, if it is subplural or uh, paraceptal, that kind of a thing. Uh, but again, I would be descriptive in this saying that there's patchy fibrosis, there's some fibroblast foci. Um, this could still represent UIP in the proper appropriate clinical setting. Uh, but in the cryobiopsy, I'll be descriptive and take it to the MDD and then fight between uh, smoking related and then UIP and also look at the radiology, how the radiology globally has involved. Um, if it's a lower low predominant process and, and uh, where did they biopsy this from, which part of the lobe or where exactly. So those details I would collect and then um, looks like it's an MDD final kind of a thing. You say always that my biopsies are so good, I wanted to, <laughs> to bring my normal biopsies are like this, 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 this kind of, I have to deal with this thing. That is not bad because I have a piece that is big, but this is... Yeah. This is, I think, what most people that are looking at cryobiopsies are facing. Some fibrosis with some fibroblastic uh, foci, and what what are we going to do with this? Because there, is, there are also smoking, as Raghav said, smoking-related changes, maybe. So what do you think, the rest of you? Yeah, this is a, a very good example of... Actually, what Raghav said is a very good example of what, you know, how many people approach it is bring it to the MDD and all that. Like for me, this is UIP. This is just UIP on the biopsy alone. And it doesn't matter what the MDD says or, or what the radiology says. So I do not see the MDD's role as telling me what the biopsy finding of UIP is or isn't. I see the MDD's role as what to do with the biopsy finding. Is it to place it in a clinical context to whether they want to call it IPF or not. I don't see the MDD as saying whether a UIP case is UIP or not. I will accept this is like, you know, it's not as great as a surgical lung biopsy and Raghav's point is well taken about you don't see the distribution and all that, but you have architectural distortion, you have fibroblast foci, you have a one piece which is completely scarred, you have patchwork pattern. The only thing you're missing is honeycombing, but the rest, but other than that, you have UIP. I mean, I, I, I don't see why I would step back. But I, but what Raghav said is exactly what many people do in this setting: is they will, they will wait for the MDD and then kind of take it from there. I think that's that's the reality of this of, of ILD practice. But I, for me, this is UIP. That's what I would call. It. Any uh, the other Sharda Matt, what do you think? I have to say, I don't see a lot of cryobiopsies in my practice, so um, I, I agree it's suspicious for, for UIP, but I don't have a, um, a great perspective on how far to go in this cryobiopsy, because um, I'm used to seeing wedges for them. Um, the, uh, Matt, Matt is, think, is thinking, poor, poor woman, she has, to, she has to, to deal with this piece of tissue. This is exactly what what yeah, we, we get the, we get similar kind of cryobabs this year, much smaller. Uh, but like Sanjay was saying, like this finding, um, definitely the UIP would be the leading uh, differential diagnosis. Uh, uh, and you can definitely argue this, nothing else could uh, can look like this. Um, and most of the times we have the radiology uh, available, the findings available, um, more than just uh, the the just what they say, the de description, we do have access to the description. So generally in the comment, I tend to say that this could still represent UIP and uh, uh, and also the only thing the MDD can help in this setting can be to exclude other causes which can give rise to an UIP kind of process. Um, that's the only other side I can see, but I agree with all the comments and also Sanjay's perspective on this that, um, the features are there for UIP. So um, Raghav, you know, one, one way to look at it is to look at it from the liver, kind of like the liver pathology yeah. point of view. Yeah. So in liver pathology, you know, when they get a cirrhosis case, hmm. 
the cirrhosis people, the liver pathologists, they say this is cirrhosis. Mm. Yeah. Right. They don't say let's wait and take it to the MDD and <laughs> and see with, whether he is drinking alcohol or not. Right. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> what if they say what if they say it's Wilson's disease? Then this won't be cirrhosis. You know. But in <laughs> lung, we don't look at it like that. We say, well, right. you know, what if they say he has a parakeet? Then it will turn out to be hypersensitivity. Then I will look stupid because I said UIP and it's actually not UIP. So yeah. you know, the the problem is in our system, not in in the you know, our system is we don't have a cirrhosis equivalent diagnosis in, in lung pathology. Actually, it, there is a diagnosis and that's UIP. There is a cirrhosis equivalent, but that our way of looking at it is very different in lung than how the liver people look at it. I think their system is much more practical is that once they see the cirrhosis pattern, they just call it cirrhosis. But when we see the UIP pattern, we, we, we're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, you know? <laughs> so I think there's a there's a difference. And I, I think we would be much better off if we had a liver type system where we could call it what it is and then they can, they can do whatever in terms of etiology, you know? Yeah, agreed. Maybe the agreed. criteria are not that as good as in cirrhosis. Because uh, if we, we say, patchy fibrosis with five fibroblast foci, is UIP, but you can have patchy fibrosis with fibroblast foci in a pneumothorax. Because I've seen, okay. I've seen fibroblast foci in a pneumothorax. Then they give you a piece of pneumothorax without a history, without a uh, CT, and and you are done. But you say UIP, and then yeah. they would say, but this pathology is stupid. <laughs> no. Yes, yes, good point, good point, Irene. Sorry, Sharada, you, you wanted to so comment even, yeah, something? Even I signed it out because of all the features that Sanjay had mentioned, like, you know, patchy fibrosis and fibroblastic foci. And yeah, there is, I couldn't see any honey coming, but still I would like to put it as UIP. I, this, these cases that are well, like this or not, don't have everything that UIP says, I, I diagnose it as patchy fibrosis with fibroblastic foci. And I make a comment saying that this, this, this has some elements of UIP, but not all, and this is a probable UIP or something like that, and, and I leave it like that. The, in, I think the, the, the ground truth is not the CT, that is the problem that, that Sanjay was, was saying, that, that we say, oh, let's go to the MDD to know if I'm right. No, and, and the, the ground truth is what happens to the patient, and if this patient uh, it's in, under transplant in three years. This is UIP. This is the thing. But this patient died, and we would never know. Sorry, we would never know if this is UIP. Or not. So, um, what about this terminology, unclassifiable interstitial fibrosis? Sorry. Yeah, we do use it, Shardas. Um, actually, fairly commonly for for cases that are fibrotic ILDs, but don't have classic UIP. You know that we cannot call UIP on pathology. We end up saying, well, I cannot classify it any further. Then the MDD comes and they say, well, we cannot classify it any further. And that at the end of it, we ended up classifying it as unclassifiable. That happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we do use it once in a while. So I was thinking like in between the three, like um, UIP and SIP and airway-related fibrosis. So the best fit in this case is UIP. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. You almost wonder if there should be a pathology MDD, right? Where you have like three pathologists look at it, right? And get the consensus pathology criteria, right? Instead yeah. of, um, you know. That's another can of worms because there's no consensus between us either. No, I mean, I, that's not true. I mean, I think for classic yeah. cases, there is consent. It's it's like anything else. You know, the easier the case, the better the consensus. The more overlapping gray zone case, the less the consensus. I think that's, but but overlapping gray zone cases are more common in ILD than in tumor pathology, I think. That's why yeah. it becomes harder. And I think it's also important to do it independently, right? A lot of times these consensus conferences, right? One person shows it and, and then it's like, oh, well, they think it's this, right? And it's yes, and I think you, Matt, your your point is especially valid for radiology. You know, so once you know what the radiology is, like in this case, Irene told us the radiology is UIP. In that setting, it's much easier to call it UIP. I think pathologists are biased by that. 
if Irene had told us this patient is a 34 year old with bilateral ground glass opacities, we would see exactly the same thing and we'd say, no, there's no way that this is UIP. No, you're, there are too many macrophages. No, there's not enough scarring. You know, so we get so biased by the radiology that we, we, we kind of manipulate the ground truth to, to, to suit the radiology. That's another complication in, in ILD that the tumor, you know, when we do tumors, we don't have to face that that much. So do you look at the histology before looking at any history? Oh, yes, radio? absolutely. Yeah. Every time, yeah. every time. I try to, yeah. I try to give my, get my unbiased sense first, then look at the radiology and see, you know, how much fighting will I have to do? <laughs> yeah, re re residents know that when they're showing me the non-neoplastic lung, they will just give me the slides and sit quietly next to me at least for a couple of minutes without giving any history. And then they will say like, whenever you want the history, we can tell you. Uh, because it's always nice to go blinded fashion without any history and make your opinion. Uh, the direction at least, whether you want to go UIP or is it smoking or is it NSIP or connective tissue or HP, and then ask the history. And then everybody, I think it's much easier. The job is much easier. Otherwise, like, you carry this um, baggage or whatever and in the mind and you're trying, the mind is like such a crazy thing. It tries to take you in the direction, even though you don't want to go, but it plays games with you all the time, especially my mind playing games with me all the time. So in my case, it is like by default, I have to see the biopsy because I don't get the clinical findings <laughs> and <laughs> I repeatedly hand up for it. So... <laughs> So unbiased, like by default, I see all the cases unbiased. That's good case, in a way, it's, like that. it's almost better to, to see it that way because you you cannot be biased because you don't have that information. Yeah. You know, it's it's I'm I'm saying this jokingly, but I think in some ways it is better than better, getting. Yeah, you know, agree. like for example, if you sit in a multidisciplinary discussion, they start with the history, right? So they start with all this history about this and that, and the patient was a nice man, and his brother had this. You get so biased by the time you get to the pathology that, you know, even if you see, you don't believe your eyes, you know, after all that story that you have heard, <laughs> it becomes so biasing. I agree, yeah. Should we do the next case without history, Do look at the slide and then yeah. go back, ask history from Irene? Yeah, let's do that. So, Can you give us without the history the next case? Perfect. So you have to decide without any information, who is going to see? I think Raghav is clarivident because this case no needs much history. Who wants this case? One second. I think Sharda is the only one who has. No, has she done it already? Sharda, take it. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I could see this um, alveolated lung parenchyma. And. Uh, yeah, there are bronchioles and there is fibrosis. And there is this pink eosinophilic material. Yeah, I could see this pink eosinophilic material which is filling the alveolar spaces. And uh, can you go to the hyper? Yeah, this one. So, yeah, it is granular. Sharda, are you sure that there is fibrosis? Like now, now that you're looking at the high mag. No, no, no. This is not fibrosis. This is the eosinophilic material which was right, right. which is filling up the alveolar spaces. And uh, so, is it pulmonary alveolar proteinosis? So, Matt, can we do a pathology MDD before we hear the history now? Like just like you suggested. Yeah. So uh, that would be top of mind. But I would um, do. Um... GMS, just to make sure it's not. Yeah. GMS, no. Sharda, would the... you do anything else? Would you do anything extra, Sharda? Any stains yeah. or anything? Yeah, PAS and GMS is both PAS and GMS. Because Raghav, what were you saying? What if the patient is immunocompromised? PCP, yeah. PCP is another different Yeah, have. Exactly. I would say, I, I agree with Sharda. I would say there is no way in hell that this is anything else except the PAP. It cannot be. This is not what PCP looks like, guys. I mean, you know that this is not what PCP looks like, right? Yeah. There's no frothy anything. You don't see those dots. There's no interstitial pneumonia. I mean, we can, I mean, there are those little blobs in the air spaces, the little cholesterol clefts. This is classic PAP. 
no matter yeah. what the PS shows or the GMS, show. we know we all know that at some level. But w- w- would you would you not do the GMS though? Well, the, but you can do it if you want to. Yes, of course. Yeah, but but but, but would you? Even, would, that, no, even no. I do, even I, I do a GMS because I wanted to rule out uh, any secondary, you know, uh, fungal infections in this. Yeah, it would now be very interesting to hear if there's anything in the clinical that doesn't fit, and then what what difference that makes to the pathology. Mm-hmm. I don't think it makes any difference. Because this is this is PAP no matter what the clinical is. Okay, then. I mean, yeah. secondary secondary PAP can occur in immunocompromised people. Uh, only the the primary ones is because of the GMCSF antibody kind of stuff. And yeah, then sec- there is yeah congenital one with the surfactant protein uh, deficiencies or mutations. So the yeah. secondary ones can still have, and they can be focal PAP kind of pattern. But uh, this one looks more diffuse and everywhere. And that eosinophilic globules are standing out um, in between that uh, pink pink material. I generally call this as pink alveolar proteinosis than pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Raghav, have you seen the secondary? Uh, no, I've not. <laughs> I've not. That's all in the right. Unless you're a pediatric pathologist, you're never going to see that ever no, in your no. life. No, I have and, seen. Uh, I have and, seen PAP. Yeah, but but do you see, do you see pediatric path? Uh, I used to right. see in my previous workplace. Yeah, so then you will see it. But if you see only adult path, you're never going to see those congenital things. Mm-hmm. And the only secondary PAP you're ever going to see is in silicosis cases. So you'll see silicoproteinosis in a massive silicosis background, but not in a biopsy like this, right? I mean, there's nothing to do with silica anywhere here. There's no silicotic nodules, no dust, no anything. So those theoretical things about what else this could be are really theoretic. I mean, I would say the chance that this is anything else is very close to zero other than PAP. <laughs> Let's see. Let's I've see. Seen, Maybe Irene will prove us wrong here. I've seen um, an, an exudate like this um, in some explants that are not silicotic. In, in some areas, like this, this similar this similar looking, but in, in very little area, focally, I mean. And so I don't know the, the meaning of So Irene, what is the chance that this is a fibrotic ILD where they have missed all the fibrosis and they just managed to hit that small area of PAP <laughs> on, the, on a bus, on a cryo bus? <laughs> I don't think there is a I mean, let's be the, And the story fits yeah. with the thing. It's a 50 years old man, like smoker who works in construction, and who has chronic respiratory failure in study. And he's admitted admitted to the hospital because of acute respiratory failure. And the city sees crazy paving and the ball, the bronchoalveolar lavage yeah. is white and everything that, that goes with that. But they treat the patient and the patient doesn't uh, improve. And this is very weird for them and they decide to to do a biopsy to see if there is something else. So I did the GMS and it was negative and I had to diagnose protein, uh, alveolar proteinosis. Did you do a PAS, uh, Irene? No, because I hate PAS and I hate <laughs> the, <laughs> the people that order PAS in my biopsies and I have to look at the PAS. <laughs> <laughs> so no, wait, let me ask Sharda because she said PAS, right? So Sharda, my question for you is, let's say in a biopsy like this, your PAS is negative, or it's you know it's very light staining, so it's basically almost negative. Would you then say that this is not PAP? This is PAP. <laughs> so that is my point. You know, like when the when the histology is so classic, what does the PAS really add to what you have? Would you believe it if it was negative? You know, you, you wouldn't, right? Like in a solitary fibrous tumor. If your STAT6 was negative, you'd say, no, this is not solitary fibrous tumor, right? It, it, it cannot be. But in this setting, would you, you know, I, I feel that the PS is not sufficiently sensitive that you, it would it would say that this is not PAP because of it. That's the reason that I, I don't do it. It's not like you shouldn't do it, but I, I feel like even if it was negative, it would not change my mind. But, yeah, other, um, other than just adding color to the slide, I think the yeah. PAS, <laughs> PAS yeah. would not add anything. But I, I, I agree with Pat that I would generally, and Irene, that I would generally do a GMS, even though I know that it's going to be negative. Otherwise, like the pulmonologist would call me and tell me, did you do a GMS to exclude PJP? 
and then again, I have to go back and do it. So I just do it on the go so that I don't have to go back on the case. I've even had guys, a pul pulmonologist call and say, like, you know, alveolar macrophages, like you get in every biopsy, <laughs> for me, macrophages here and there. They called and said, can you do a BRAF mutation testing to exclude Erdheim Chester? <laughs> I said, uh, no. They said, but but do it, do it, please, uh, because uh, I've heard that in, in Erdheim Chester, you get foamy macrophages. And I was like, please, please, somebody kill me now and <laughs> put me out of this misery. <laughs> You, you got to come work in Canada, Sanjay. You just say, oh, that testing's not indicated for this. The government doesn't fund it. Sorry. And, I want uh, to move to Canada. Please, please put me in Canada now. <laughs> <laughs> they, love, they love to have something that is objective and that they can, yeah. yes. can see uh, because they don't understand when we are, we are talking about these things that we see and the fibroblastic for science. Or so. so when there is something like CD1A or BRAF or these things that are objective for, for them. If we can say CD1A is, is objective, uh, <laughs> they, they love to have these things. Yes, but they can get into trouble with that, Irene, right? Like we have to explain to them, what if you get a BRAF positive in a case which has no morphologic findings of Erdheim Chester? You'll, you'll get into more trouble, you know, you'll go down a rabbit hole that there's going to be, it, it's going to create more trouble for the patient, not to mention the added cost of that un, unindicated testing for, for the patient. So I think there is, I agree with you. I see it from their point of view, but I think we need to at least push back a little bit on things that are completely not indicated and tell them once in a while, look, please don't do this. It doesn't make sense in this case, you know? Agree. Like the Canadians. In such cases in PAP, it's like sometimes the clinician asks to do a PAS. Yeah. 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 No, I, I agree, Shada. I mean, I, I know why people do it. I'm just trying to explain why I don't do it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. I, I get the point. And clinicians will sometimes write on the paperwork, you know, they'll say, yeah, suspected say PAP, PAP, please do PAS. Yes, they do this. <laughs> I think just like they, they say, they... suspected vaping, please do oil red o. Right? Suspected vaping. <laughs> I think the only times that they have asked PAS to me were when they were not, uh, uh, when, when the clinical picture was not that clear for them. So that, that's when they want, if you say prote uh, alveolar proteinosis in this case, they are okay. But if it, I remember one time that we had it in a transplant patient or something like that, or they, they are not, not this, the story doesn't fit, so they want something else. Sanjay, on, on, in your reports, you maybe should uh, start indicating tests the clinicians should do that, that really obscure, like suggest whisper pectriloquy or something like that uh, <laughs> to rule out uh, consolidation of the right lower lobe. Uh, uh, yeah, to... I should say, you know, in ILD cases, suggest taking a full clinical history with <laughs> HP questionnaire as, <laughs> as suggested by the ATSDRF. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous, you know, it's ridiculous that one specialty can can force another one to do an unindicated test, but that's, that's just yeah. how it is. That's our life. We have to deal with it. <laughs> Sorry? It has to you be mind. mine. Yeah, mine. No history, please. No history. So no history, history no. for you. <laughs> Here, the liver, in this case, not liver. non cirrhotic liver. <laughs> My God, I once in a while when I see another non-lung organ, I'm like, oh my God, I really miss non-pulmonary yes, <laughs> yeah. so No I'm cirrhosis in the liver. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we've got alveolated lung, beautiful Irene cryobiopsy, big, big pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's trying to show me something, but... <laughs> no, <laughs> so just no, 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 just, just wanted to go farther there. One. So far, I don't see a lot. There's a little, okay, so there's a little bit of uh, inflammation in the interstitium, like here. There's a multinucleated giant cell next to that one. There's a, <laughs> yeah, very, thank you for showing me at high Maggie. <laughs> I would have missed that. 
there is a carcinoid tumorlet, I think, there. Yeah, there's the carcinoid tumorlet. Um, I saw a little bit of elastotic scarring in the background of that tumorlet and here and there. Um, what else? Show me high Yeah, this is definitely a tumorlet. Um, what else? There's a bronchiole here. There's some normal lung to the right. I'm not very impressed by any of this. No, but. Chronic inflammation, minimal. Some elastic scarring next to the, on the left-hand side. Very little, not impressed. Same, elastic scarring, minimal, minimal chronic inflammation, patchy. Do you, I think this far we can say it's not NSIP. Yes. Because we have normal lung and it's not UIP because we haven't seen. Yes, um, agreed. Neuroelastic foci or, or scarring. So what would you do with this biopsy? Nothing, nothing. Descriptive. <laughs> but yes. if they, if you go to the history and they say that it's a 80 year old man smoker and it's a farm it's a farm <laughs> does it no it does not change my diagnosis at all but there's one no, giant cell sanjay there's one giant cell <laughs> and there there are yeah. some some there is some some inflammation yeah so if, if they say we really want to make this uh, hp i'll be like fine the ch changes are extremely minimal and not really very convincing. But if you know if, if it's classic HP by clin clinical findings, that's great. No, but here, for example, I see some some inflammation in this yes. interstitium, and I found the the giant cell. Yeah. So some some pneumonitis, and it's a bit centrally localized. Agreed. Yeah, I think that's fine. So this the with the well. With the history, it it could be um, it could HP? be HP. Sure. Without the history, without the history, it's I, <laughs> without I, the history, it's nothing. I'll diagnose. I'll, I'll diagnose that. I mean, I'll say uh, patchy like pneumonitis uh, with one giant cell something. I don't know. I don't remember the name I said to that, but it's something that the well, it, it, I would diagnose it. I would say it, in, and and if if it goes with the history, they have an HP. Yes, you agreed. won't say uh, look for HP with that. You won't say. You won't What's say. that? Look for HP. Look for mm. HP, and it's because when I see light uh, pneumonitis and a giant cell, I put a comment like um, this. This could be HP. Just uh, if, if you think so, or I, I don't know. I say it in Spanish. Uh, this could be HP in the appropriate context. Yes, yes. No, I think that's fair. I I probably wouldn't because I I hold out for a little bit more, more lymphocytosis, a few more giant cells. But if you suggest that, I think that's fair. I, it's not a it's not unreasonable for the same reasons. I mean, you could also suggest CTDILD. You could suggest drug. I don't think that's unreasonable either, but uh, yeah, it's it's okay to suggest. I don't think it's very <laughs> classic. That that's how I would put it. It's not a classic HP. Guys, so other, from... uh, Sharda, Matt, Raghav. I will go for a deeper section before I. <coughs> I I have I have I don't have it here for you. Sorry, but I have uh, I have many sections in this. <laughs> In this case, and it's the this is the the good section, the one that had the the giant cell, and I have mm, not 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 more because things of it. In my experience, in such cases, um, you know, the deeper sections did reveal a granuloma with few multinucleated giant cells. Yeah, I agree with Sanjay. I think I'd be descriptive. I, I think I just highlight some pertinent negatives. Um, but, you know, this could be HP, but I would once again highlight that it's really kind of mild changes and uh, make sure that it correlates with everything, right? Because I would just worry that it's a poorly sampled biopsy too, right? So, um, Irene, what was the history that made this HP in this case? What was what was the 
compelling thing in the history? Also, that... the, the city, no, well, the, he was a farmer. Oh, farmer, okay. And um, the city was classic. I, I miss the, to say the, the city. The city was uh, emphysema with ground glass and air trapping. So and they... the what? Air, air, trapping. Air, trapping. air trapping. Air trapping. Let's say the patient was not a farmer, but the CT showed the same finding. Would it still be HP? I think so. In, in my be. hospital? Yeah. In my hospital? I think so. So it's really the CT that's driving and not the farmer, right? What if there was ground glass but no air trapping? Would it still be HP? It's not a year. Good question. <laughs> See, the, what I'm trying to get at is that the clinical features that make it HP are also very fuzzy. They are fuzzy yeah. features which can change with, with you know, one parakeet versus three parakeet, parakeet, farmer versus live close to a farm, air trapping versus mosaic versus something else. It's very fuzzy and it's very open to, to negotiation and discussion, you know. There's nothing, there's nothing definitive about it, like PAP, SRIF, you know, something that you can put your foot down on hp is very negotiable as with a with a biopsy like this Good. yeah i agree uh, definitive features are not present so i would like matt was saying exclude pertinent negatives again depends how much we can exclude uh, considering the area of the biopsy but otherwise the findings are very subtle and minimal and uh, i'll be descriptive as well and open for negotiation. Yeah, I mean, it could be the other way around too. You could say this is a 43-year-old woman who yeah. has been breeding pigeons since, since she was 15 years old. She gets right. symptomatic every time she comes in the home and comes out. Right. If they told me that, I'd say, oh yeah, great. This is HP, fine. <laughs> you know, of course it is in that setting, but it's it very much is setting dependent here. It's not dependent on the pathology. A bit of bronchiolitis also. Yes. No, it's uh, it's true. I think, but I I'm afraid that HP is now just like UAP. That is something that they that it's so city driven. Yes. That it, I I think sometimes it's not is suggested not to not to do the biopsy uh, in some settings. I mean, if you have the the city and the the these antigens or antibodies done. They can not to do a, a biopsy, so it's something that that so city driven nowadays. Yes, agreed. That's because the radiologists. Are, no, I'm just I'm just kidding. But part of the reason is the radiologists are always united. You know, they say yes, yes, radiology can do this and ground glass. It's very safe for the patient. Biopsy is so dangerous, <laughs> and pathologists are always fighting among themselves. They have no in terms of a reproducibility, so they make us look so bad. That, that the overall story is always that radiology is always better and pathologists are always fighting about whether it's UIP or not and this and that. That's the overall story for the clinician. You know, it's much easier to do a CT, much safer for the patient. So why not just do just a CT and forget about the biopsy? What about so your tumor, let Irene? What did you do with that? Ignored. <laughs> Let's say ignored. Yeah. I, I, I think the the bronchoscopists have a special a, a feeling for tumorlets or or meningotelial nodules, and then when you look at an explant, this is so so minimal yes. that you that that you think what were the chances that they got that in the in the bronchoscopy. I don't know if the if the bronco if the probe goes to to plumpy things or <laughs> what, but I see many many endothelial nodules, many tumorlets. Yes. What would in you do if the, I, if the CT was classic for dip neck? What I no. Do? I mean, I did uh, chromogranin in this in this case to see if it has uh, if it had. Um, uh, Neuroendocrine hyper hyperplasia, uh, in addition to the to the tumorlet, but it had not. Was only the the tumorlet. I couldn't see more uh, chromogranin positive cells in the in the bronchial lobe. If the we have this problem with deep neck, no? Now that that there is a pathologic definition, that it's uh, like a 
Because the definition and then the, the syndrome definition. Yes. So big problem. And nobody agrees on what DIPNEC is or how it should be defined or whether it's pathological or clinical. Big problem. But in this case, as there was no hyperplasia, I had no, no problem. You had your so, giant cell, so you're done. The giant cell wins over the, the tumor <laughs> It's a great case. Yeah, That's the nice. mighty, mighty giant cell wins over the groups of carcinoid yeah. tumor -led cells. They had a little battle, the giant cell versus the tumor -led, <laughs> And once the CT came up, the, the tumor -led fell down, <laughs> defeated by the <laughs> To be honest, I, uh, I think it, I've seen this more times than... That, that's why I don't say this is HP. Never. Even when it's classic, I, I don't say it in the line. Because I, I feel I, I've seen uh, pneumonia a, a bit. What is the definition? Because you are mar much more strict, but as, as I'm so light <laughs> to say that, yeah, I, I um, what is to, to have some pneumonitis and to have a, a, a giant cell is nothing that that's uh, I think I, I, we can see it in many in many settings, but we also have seen it in, in proven uh, HP. So I don't. Know. Yes, and that's actually one of the arguments I make is. It, Pathologists, like you are saying, Irene, many pathologists don't even call it HP on the line diagnosis, even if it is classic HP, right? They will describe and not call it. So I say, even if with the full-blown classic HP features, if you don't call it HP, then why does one granuloma in a UIP case make it HP? It makes no sense. It makes no sense to me that, that there are different criteria for different things. But anyway, that's a discussion for the different time. Well, it's great thank thing. you. Lovely think, case. Lovely I case. I think Greg has to go to a frozen. So thanks. Okay. Everyone. I think we're yeah. done, right? Yeah, we're done. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll get thank this you. all edited and uh, put together. Great discussion, guys. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Enjoy. Thanks for joining. Great right, cases, Ernie.